This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. So we're very pleased to welcome Gwil Colenzo, who's a regular attender at the seminar. And um, yeah, let me just read his description of how I must describe him. <laughs> so, Gwilym Colenzo is an independent researcher based here in London and his research on some aspects of South African history has included the missionary and political campaigning work of Bishop Colenso of Natal and his family. More recently, he has begun to look into the missionary work of Colenso's cousin, William Colenso of New Zealand, hence the dual um, title of uh, the splendid poster, uh, John William Colenso, Bishop of Natal, and William Colenso of New Zealand, 19th century Protestant missionary cousins in conflict with their bishops and colonial governors. And as you will surmise, Gwil is in fact related. Um, he's descended from a brother of the New Zealand Colenso and knew about Bishop uh, John William before first going to South Africa and went there partly to find out more about him. And when he was in Peter Maritzburg, Gwil was referred to John Dean, chair of the Colenso Homestead Conservation Project, who took Gwil out to Bishopstow, the old uh, homestead of the bishop and his family, uh, told Gwil to read Jeff Guy's The Heretic and to go and see Charles Swaysland at Rhodes House back in England to try and pursue things further. So that's what got Gwil started. Um, we also want to uh, say a special welcome to the people from Skolba, the uh, library and archives group on Africa who have uh, uh, especially stayed on to from after a meeting to come and, and, and hear Gwil. So we're very pleased to hand over to you and I know you have a lot of visual material and other yeah. fascinating <coughs> material based on the handouts and so on. So over to you on okay. comparing these two intriguing cousins who I see were born only within three years of yeah. each other. Yeah, yeah. over to you. Okay, thanks Debbie for that uh, introduction. And also thanks to the organisers for inviting me to give this talk. And I should say, given what Debbie said, that um, these are two very controversial characters, but despite the fact I'm related distantly to them, I'm completely unbiased with regard to making a judgment about them, so I just thought I'd let you know that. Um, okay, now I wanted to begin by um, remembering Jeff Guy, who, who tragically died recently, after only having recently given a talk at a conference about Bishop Clenzo in Cambridge. And um, he's the author of The Heretic, which is a sort of major work in um, the study of Bishop Colenso. He's obviously al also a leading um, historian of South African history. And, up a little bit? Okay, sorry, okay, right. Um, yes, this is in memory of Jeff Guy, a leading historian of, of South African history, author of The Heretic, a major biography of Bishop Colenso. He's also recently completed a monumental study of uh, Theophilus Shepstone, who does have a bearing on our story because he was the Secretary for Native Affairs in Natal and worked very closely with Bishop Clenso for um, a long period of time until they fell out badly, which I'll come back to later on, hopefully. Um, now, oh yeah, that's a statue of him in Piesa Maritzburg, which is one of the only two statues in that city, the other one being of a Queen Victoria. So it shows how regarded he was by the locals there. Um, these are the credits, um, some of whom are in the room, so thank you. Um, on, the, on the left, that is, uh, for John William Colenso. Um, the names under William Colenso include Ian St George, who's the secretary of the Colenso Society in New Zealand, which publishes an, an, um, an online journal about William Colenso, and it's contributed to by other members of the society and relatives of um, William Colenso in New Zealand, Australia and Canada and they have produced a lot of original research on William Colenso and also done a lot of work transcribing um, handwritten <coughs> journals and letters and so on. Okay, now um, what I had meant to do was to produce, provide a um, uh, publications list which I didn't manage to get done unfortunately but if I had done they would all have been publications on either one or the other. The only book that's on both is this um, book by A.L. Rouse, which is about both the Colenzos. He's the late A.L. Rouse. He's a historian 
of Elizabethan history, or he was anyway. So what's he doing writing about this? Well, he's a Cornishman, and um, he's very keen on promoting Cornwall and Cornish people. And so he's done this sort of joint biography, and he refers a lot to the character of um, the, two brother, the two cousins, and um, he sort of tries to relate that to the, the uh, geographical um, situation in Cornwall, the uh, country. And so, following on from his biography, I tried to sort of pick out some points of character. It's really a sort of big man, great man theory of history, this, but never mind, let's uh, give it a go. And um, what we've got is um, some points that he mentions, rugged individualism, which is true of the Cornish people, he says. Um, but I've sort of uh, modified some of the points he's made, and I think that they, there is a point, the scrupulousness, meticulousness and conscientiousness, which they both both had, single-minded, hard-working, prolific writers, controversy, they didn't seek it out, but they didn't avoid it if they thought they were in the right, um, which operated to, often to their disadvantage, and lacking in tact, um, it's thought sometimes, unfortunately. Okay, now if we look at the two cousins, um, I just want to suggest that the posture of these of them in these photographs perhaps suggests a difference. One is um, uh, Bishop John William Cleanser was sort of perhaps more centred and relaxed. William Cleanser was a bit more sort of Jeremy Paxman, sort of, which is kind of like a bit a bit defensive, aggressive, perhaps a bit bitter. And I, one couldn't blame him really if uh, if it is. Okay, and I want to look at the um, similarities between them in their mission field. And um, so that's rather strangely headed. First of all, they both ended up challenging the authority of the church and, to different degrees, the political authorities. Uh, they were both closely associated with indigenous peoples. Oh. I was just talking about the similarities in the situation between the two cousins, John William Colenso and William Colenso. And um, first of all, I wanted to mention the challenge. They both challenged the authority of the church and, to different degrees, the political authorities. Um, they were close, they formed close associations with the indigenous people, um, which led them taking to the, quotes native point of view, uh, which quite often set them at odds with the settlers and colonial authorities, and they both regarded printing as a key part of their missionary work. Okay, um, all right, however, what I wanted to suggest is that in their challenge to the authorities and powers that be, um, John William Clins was in a stronger position than his cousin, because he had all those things, greater social standing, connections, resources and confidence to go right to the top. Whereas his cousin was a bit more of a kind of underdog and in a way had to be a sort of whistleblower and sort of chipping in from the sidelines rather than sort of taking a sort of full on um, confrontational view. Okay, so here we are in Cornwall. Okay, Penzance, our story begins in Penzance, which is the furthest west um, town in Britain. Uh, you can see it there near the Land's End and if we go back to the turn of the century the centre of Penzance you should be able to see there on the left a signboard and that is a signboard I'm pretty sure to the King's Head pub and the landlord was Robert Colenso um, who married Elizabeth Williams and his he had one son who moved John Williams who moved to St Austell and his son was um, John William Colenso, later Bishop of Natal. Another son stayed in Penzance, and his son was William Colenso, later missionary to New Zealand. So their cousins, by virtue of um, their grandfather, was the landlord of that pub. Okay, now just going back to Cornwall. Um, if you see north of Penzance is St Ives, and that was where William Colenso was um, apprenticed by his father to a printer for six years at the age of 16. At weekends, he used to walk across the peninsula to go home, and in fact, it's sort of quite endearing, really, because you can see in the high point, you can see both coastlines, and um, in some ways, it was very similar to to the um, territory, the terrain in New Zealand. So that's quite interesting. Um, however, his cousin migrated to St Austell, which you can see there, further towards Devon, and. Um, People there have told me that they don't think they're proper Cornish there because it's you know it's too far towards England, but um, so there may be a, a factor there. Okay, now um, yeah, I want to look at their status as missionaries. Um, oh, in fact, uh, yeah, I was going to just really read this out instead of okay. Um, 
The two cousins started their missionary work at different stages in their lives, William in his early 20s and John William in his early 40s, coming from different positions in the socio-economic structure of British society and occupying different positions in the hierarchy of the Church of England. William was an artisan, going out as a lay missionary, and so below the bottom rung, as it were, in the church hierarchy, as he, had not e he was not even ordained. Whereas, in contrast, Bishop Colenso was Cambridge University educated, a former master at Harrow School and a consecrated bishop. They went out on mission work sponsored by different missionary societies, see very different mission fields in different parts of the world, one being much further away than the other. The um, trip to New Zealand was six months one way, uh, whereas to South Africa, three months, roughly. So that did have a bearing on the fact that one of them never returned, uh, whereas the other did return twice during his um, missionary career. They were to work with indigenous peoples who were at different stages in their encounter with the white settler populations and at different stages of being incorporated into the British Empire under colonial rule. When William arrived there, New Zealand was not a British colony. There was therefore no colonial government and no established white settler community. When Bishop Colenso arrived in Natal, in contrast, it had been a crown colony for 10 years with a governor and colonial officials. The white settler community was well established, the African population had been incorporated into the colony and brought under colonial rule under the oversight of the Secretary for Native Affairs, Theophilus Shepstone, who we saw the statue of earlier, who was a, a very close friend of John William and used his powers to facilitate the bishop's missionary work. They worked very closely together for the first 20 years of Bishop Clinzo's missionary work. Finally, they began their, uh, the two cousins began their missionary work at different stages in the development of the British Protestant Missionary Project and at different stages in the incorporation of that project within the institutional framework of the Church of England. Now, I'll try and elaborate on that. Um, I did sort of draw up all these kind of tables, but they're too boring, so I'll skip those. Okay. Actually, I won't go on to that yet, though. Um, okay. Um, oh, yeah, now, what I wanted to say first was that... Um, the starting point of their missionary careers. Um, if we were to go out of here across Russell Square, this Russell Square, is it that way? Okay, and then down to the Aldwych and turn left along Fleet Street. Oh, sorry, I've got it wrong. Yes, I've, I've got it wrong. Oh, uh, okay, yes, well, wherever. Anyway, ask the porter on the way out. Okay, and um, if you turn left down Fleet Street from the Aldwych, you'd get to Salisbury Square, which is the which was the headquarters of the CMS, the Church Missionary Society, where William Clenzo began his career. If you were to turn right at the Aldwych, go down the Strand, Whitehall, past the House of Parliament, look across the river, then you'll see um, St Mary's Church there, uh, which was where 20 years later Bishop Colenso was consecrated um, Bishop of Natal. And um, he was consecrated by, that's a closer view, he was consecrated by two bishops, because you need two bishops to consecrate a bishop, there was only one bishop to consecrate a, a priest, I've since found out and they were the Bishop of Cape Town, Robert Gray, and secondly, Samuel Wilberforce, the Bishop of Oxford. Now he was mentioned in a talk to this series of seminars by Stephen Morn uh, last year in connection with his promoting the um, Anglo-Catholic mission to Hawaii, uh, which, was promoted, which was sort of sponsored by Bishop Staley. But he was also considered to be the most powerful, the leading bishop in Britain, with a particular interest in promoting bishops, new dioceses and bishops for them overseas in the colonies or even beyond. And um, so he was uh, quite an important person. It's quite um, ironic actually that these two bishops were, having consecrated Bishop Clenzo in 53, were later to become his major adversaries when um, they took issue with him over his biblical criticism. So there was a sort of turnaround there. And that's not unconnected with the fact that they that um, Samuel Wilberforce also was the leading uh, opponent of Darwin's, Charles Darwin's evolutionary theory of natural selection. Um, and he featured in a notorious debate in Oxford where he and T.H. Uh, Huxley locked horns um, and Huxley could have claimed to have trounced him. But um, so there was a kind of um, conflict there between Samuel Wilberforce on the one hand and Charles Darwin, uh, uh, Charles Darwin supporters, which I've listed some of them there. And they include Charles Lyell, who was thought to be the elder statesman of the progressive scientists, so-called. And if you look at um, 
the conflict between Wilberforce and Bishop Colenso. Um, the supporters of Bishop Colenso also included some of the names of the supporters of the Darwinian theory, and um, and they were they were also um, uh, members of the so-called X Club because they couldn't decide what name to give it, and um, they did support Bishop Colenso. Uh, contributed to his fund for his uh, defence and invited him to their ex-club meetings and they saw the, the two kind of um, uh, uh, issues as sort of very closely closely related. So um, now there is actually an indirect connection here with uh, William Colenso because the names of the scientists there that are underlined all went on round the world voyages um, as naturalists um, collecting specimens and so on and two of them, the top two, dropped in in New Zealand and met up with William Colenso, <laughs> would you believe it? And uh, Charles Darwin just spent a day with him, but um, Joseph Hooker spent three months with William Colenso in New Zealand, uh, going on specimen and collecting outings and so on, and they established a, a lifelong um, friendship, so there's a sort of connection there, really. Um, okay, now, um, <coughs> Wilberforce's um, sort of um, engagement with Darwinism was seen by the Darwinists as being a sort of parallel to his engagement with Bishop Clenso's biblical criticism, so much so that they actually kind of coined a, a name for it, and they called it Clenzoism. And in fact, you could say that the two issues are kind of related, because if Darwin, what Darwin said was true, then Genesis, the first book of the Pentateuch, was not true, because the species uh, had, had evolved rather than remained immutable since they went into the ark and came out again. Um, and similarly, if Bishop Colenso, as criticism of the Pentateuch was true, then Genesis was also untrue. And in fact, interestingly, it was actually the story of the Ark that led one of Colenso's um, translators or interpreters among his uh, Zulu converts to raise a query and say, "Look, you know, are you kidding? This can't, you know, this can't be true." And um, that led to Bishop Colenso's uh, biblical criticism. Okay, now going back to um, St Mary's Church, which is where um, Bishop Clenzo was ordained, that building next to it, as probably most of you know, is um, Lambeth Palace, or the gateway to Lambeth Palace, which actually suggests to my mind there's a sort of connection between the sponsoring of Bishop Clenzo by the SPG, that's the um, Society for Propagation of the Gospel, is actually connected with at least the symbol of the centre of power in the Church of England. Um, in contrast, I would suggest, to the organisation that sponsored William Colenso's uh, missionary work, um, the CMS, which was located geographically quite near to where we are here, but actually um, their approaches to mission work were miles apart. So I just wanted to clarify what CMS and SPG stand for. Okay, and I wanted to sort of, you know, hopefully sort of briefly um, have a look at the different approaches that are involved here because they do have a bearing on the conflicts that um, William Clenzo and Bishop Clenzo were involved in. So um, this is all a bit oversimplified, and so be prepared to be <laughs> oversimplified. Okay, I'm just kind of like classifying CMS as low church, SPG as high church. Now, these are terms that they used themselves at the time, so I don't think that's too off the wall. Um, low church, emphasizing the power of the word of God. High church, emphasizing the church structure and sacraments, obviously accepting the power of the word of God as well, but within a developing an institutional framework. Um, the approaches to mission, um, some historians have characterised the CMS type approach as a voluntary, voluntarism, along with other non-conformist mission societies uh, compared to the SPG, and also interdenominational. This is, I'm looking at the first half of the 19th century here. Um, the CMS were quite happy to, to cooperate with other with societies of other denominations, um, whereas the SPG weren't. And once they got out to the mission field, um, probably getting a bit complicated here, but there's there's these two ideal extremes, which I might be on shaky ground here, so I'd be quite happy to be um, corrected on this, but the, um, the CMS would be on the side of a gospel without a church, going out, preaching the gospel, getting the church in later, whereas the alternative to that is planting the church first, establishing a church structure and hierarchy to work within, as opposed to on, on the left hand side here we've got um, confronting the individual heathen that's using the term heathen not in a purgative word just somebody who is not aware of Christianity but confronting them with the power of the word of God 
and we've got quotes here on either side um, which basically I'm putting it very crudely at the bottom there the um, the CMS view is sort of bishop last and the other view is bishop first um, or you could say bottom up top down and I'm sure that's sort of oversimplifying things but anyway okay um, now there was a shift that took place it's been suggested around the 1840s <coughs> from the one interdom interdenominational or non-denominational approach towards the um, the more SPG approach and in fact I would suggest that William Colenso was kind of like when he went out it was it was at the time when his change was taking place and he sort of fell foul of that really but um, <coughs> okay um, Okay, now I wanted to look at um, the social origins of the missionaries and there is this very good PhD by Sarah Potter um, and what she suggests is that where they came from is small towns, commercial towns, ports which exactly fits in with um, where William Colenso came in, came from um, and their socio-economic background was that they were artisans or skilled workers and she says that the apprenticeship system reached its high points in this period and um, so, oh yeah, and these are the kind of occupations that she suggests are fairly common. Okay, okay now the timing. Okay, oh no, sorry. Uh, okay. Oh yeah, okay. Now, sorry, in terms of those, those kind of occupations, which are quite lowly occupations, um, there was a sort of shift of emphasis on them, how they were described, and initially uh, there was talk of godly mechanics. These were sort of like simple men, practical men, but they had, you know, God in their hearts. But less respectfully, um, there was that kind of description, which was a more sort of disparaging view of them. And later on in the century, as time moved on, we moved on to gentlemen or gentlemanly missionaries, and there was a shift there, which again I would suggest um, uh, William got a bit caught up in. Okay. Now, if we go on to the timing of when they became missionaries, um, according to Sarah Potter, it was at the end of or just after the end of their apprenticeship, um, in their 20s. Now, both of those apply exactly to William Glenzo's situation. He was 24 uh, when he went out. He just finished his apprenticeship a year or so before then. Um, but also, she says, after a conversion experience. So how does this apply? Well, some historians <laughs> have looked at the conversion experience involving... Um, a number of elements, awareness of sin, doubts about the possibility of salvation, struggling with Satan, and finally a realisation that salvation was possible. Now, this actually accords with William Cleanser's experience. He started a diary on the 1st of May, 1833, and it was full of those first three bullet points, struggling with Satan and so on. And then on the 14th of May, something happened. And um, he awoke as if a voice had said, seek and you shall find... Um, all day Satan assailed him but in, he went to a prayer meeting that night and he entered the chapel he fell on his knees notice he's, it's a prayer meeting not a church service and it's a chapel not a church um, the, the shackles fell off the prisoner was free um, the love of God shed in, in his heart what pen or tongue can describe the raptures that I felt and he went home prayed and um, he then says he ended the day uh, saying that he was made child of God and inheritor of the kingdom of heaven so that's sort of pretty strong uh, words really so I think you know that's we could say that's his conversion experience but I think the bottom line here is very important because he says he wants to be up and doing God's work and that's a theme that um, historians of the evangelical movement um, which which um, the evangelical awakening of the late 18th early 19th century um, commented on the need to be doing something practical not just sort of sitting around wallowing in being saved but to be up and doing and in fact that's what spurred him on and perhaps many other people in his position to do missionary work so he went to London worked as a printer and um, and uh, he heard about the request from New Zealand for a printer um, from Henry Williams who was a, a missionary in New Zealand and so he wrote a letter to the CMS um, saying he understands they want somebody a printer in New Zealand he makes three points First, I'm a printer. Second, I, I can, I'm a bookbinder. He says rather endearingly, could, I, could he be combined with the printing department there? 
little did he know he would be the printing department there. Cause <laughs> they didn't even have a printing press, never mind a department. But third, he's prepared to carry forever the cross of the um, the cause of the cross. So he's saying, "I'm a simple man, I'm a plain man. I've got these practical skills, and I'm full of fervor to sort of uh, for the cause of the cross." And these, this could be his sort of mission statement. I don't mean to pun on that word. It could be his sort of program for his life, really. Um, okay, so um, so where was he to go? He went to the Bay of Islands in North Island, New Zealand, and. I don't know if you can see it, sort of at the top knuckle of the sort of finger there, it's sort of near the top of the North Island. And why go there? Well, because Captain Cook went there in 1769 and said it was a great place to anchor ships. And uh, that was followed up by Samuel Marsden um, from New South Wales. And um, mission stations were established there. And um, it's uh, this is the sort of west coast of the bay and you can see Paihia there um, called it missionary station instead of mission station by mistake you can just see Paihia there there's a few houses but up a bit north there's a house there occupied by Mr Busby who came there just after um, William Clenzo arrived and he became the British resident with no powers but he had a house and in his garden a marquee was put up to um, to host the signing of the treaty uh, with the Maori people, which took its name from that river, you can see between his house and the mission station. So, um, okay. So this was uh, so William Clenzo went off there with his printing press. Um, it had to be sort of brought in on two canoes lashed together. Um, okay. And um, okay, I'm going to waste race through. He sort of he set up a, a typecase here for the Maori language. These are the letters needed, um, italics, capital, lowercase, etc. And um, he began printing in earnest. And um, oh yeah, this is just the Church Missionary Society register, which mentions him, and it is significant because it mentions him just as a printer. Um, so it's not really talking about him as a missionary. Okay. And there we've got the missionaries actually in New Zealand. And you see six missionaries, one printer. Um, also, there's a gender issue here because there's there's 24 married and one unmarried females. So it doesn't matter what you do if you're a woman. It just matters whether you're married or not. Um, and also the one unmarried females. I mean, this is a bit of an issue for which relates to Emily's book. What's Emily's surname? Magdalene. Yeah. Right, thank you. OK, on uh, missionary wives. Um, so that does relate to, to what she says in her book. Okay, now what happened to um, William was he was printing madly and um, after about a year and a half he managed to finish printing the whole of the New Testament um, and he says 5,000 copies, glory be to God alone. That's an example of a page. Um, and just the details of it is that he printed those 5,000 copies, 356 pages two sheets at a time. Um, he gave a thousand to the Wesleyan mission nearby and um, bound half the rest and then it was reprinted. So that's an example of his cooperation with um, other denominations. Okay, now he got a letter from the uh, clerical secretary of the CMS saying how good it was he was he was such a humble in such a humble position um, and this man says he would have been himself if he was if he was a lowly in a lowly office but you can't imagine he would have been really but actually William Clenzo didn't feel that humble and this is what he said uh, later on he says I may mention the little known but astonishing fact that this New Testament was the first publication of the sacred volume in Tara in the southern hemisphere okay well who knows but um, that was what he claimed okay all right now um, there's a lot of books uh, a lot of detail that uh, William kept in his what he called his day and waste books and these recorded um, in great detail the um, printing he did the, dis the dispensing of, of works and so on but I've just picked out one here in 1840 which includes I'm oh, sorry 1835 includes a declaration of independence um, of the native chiefs and that was a document which which uh, James Busby who lived in that house we saw earlier got him to print so it's kind of he's beginning to be used by the secular authorities as a printing press by them and then in 1840 this is 
um, Captain Hobson RN arrives and gets him to print out circulars for assembling natives at Waitangi and a proclamation. So we're obviously building up to something here. And, um, and then later on he gets him to print out the treaty um, of Waitangi. So I'll make a sort of brief diversion onto this treaty. Um, okay, why were the missionaries sort of commandeered by the prospective governor? And I suggest for those three reasons. Um, because basically they were the means by which the this um, naval captain who turned up could just communicate with the Maori and have some influence on them. Um, okay, oh, that's a, a bit out of place. Okay, now there was um, three people who were credited with um, pushing forward the signing of the treaty. Um, on the left is James Busby, in the middle is Captain Hobson, and on the right is Henry Williams, who was a senior missionary out there. And in fact, um, you could say, what were the missionaries doing, sort of taking a prominent part in getting this treaty signed? Well, in fact, it was very problematic. Um, and um, William Colenso was really sort of pushed to the back of the whole proceedings, but he did object to the signing of the treaty. And um, this is a portrait sometime afterwards which shows the um, signing. And um, William is there, sort of in the push into the background. He was given a sort of very lowly role in the proceedings. He was given tobacco and blankets to hand out as gifts to the people who had signed. Um, but he was in a position, I would suggest, as um, strongly disagreeing with the treaty, but in a very sort of un um, powerless position where he's doing anything about it. So he waited until just before the signatures were to begin, and then he did speak to the to Captain Hobson and said he thought the treaty was defective. The um, the Maori didn't understand it, by which he didn't mean that they weren't able to understand it, but it hadn't been conveyed to them properly. And um, so, but his objections were brushed aside by Captain Hobson, who said, oh, well, it's, it's down to the missionaries to explain it to them, and they should assure them it's all all right, sort of thing. And um, so, um, okay. Now, later, William Clenzo wrote a book about the treaty signing, and... Um, uh, it's interesting that he was the only person who was there to do that. So why did nobody else um, write an account of the treaty signing? I would suggest because it was a fudge and um, it was to the benefit of the people who pushed it through not to have um, any record of what actually happened. Um, the criticisms that William had of it were that um, the uh, translation was defective um, the, um, uh, the, there was a conflict of interest. The senior missionaries who were, pushing, who were very glad to be used to push it forward had an interest in it because of the land that they had uh, acquired. And also, um, he, said, he, he wrote home to the CMS and said that the, um, the chiefs who had signed it were very few in number, only from the local area around the Bay of Islands, and they were of low rank. So it didn't really seem to um, sort of legitimise it, really. But never mind all that, the Captain Hobson was quite happy to sort of have it signed and declare annexation on the basis of it. And then he aimed to run around and get other um, Maori chiefs to sign up after the event, um, but fell ill, so asked the missionaries to do that, which they went off doing, including William, and uh, got some of them to sign up. But there is an oral tradition from um, some of the Maori chiefs inland further south uh, who say that they were asked to sign, and they said, well, why do we want to sign this thing? We don't know who these people are, we've never met them. Why do you want to sign them and give them anything? And uh, they were told, well, the chiefs down at the coast have signed. But that's a bit like door-to-door -door salesmen, sort of saying, you know, your neighbours have signed up for N power. Um, why don't you sign? <laughs> and um, so they, the oral tradition is that they said, yeah, but they just did it to get the tobacco. And um, so, you know, that was, uh, that was one view. OK, now... Um, one of the um, one of the issues over translation was the the difference between sovereignty and possession, Kawana Tanga and Rangatira Tanga, which the translations were problematic. Um, Kawana Tanga uh, in English sovereignty or rulership principality, but Rangatira Tanga um, in the treaty ownership. But actually, in that confederation treaty they'd signed five years before, it was used to mean independence which you would have thought would give it some sort of stronger um, idea than just possessing the land. 
but the missionaries had used the term in the Lord's Prayer to mean kingdom and you'd have thought you know the um, sort of dominion over over something as in the as in God having dominion over the over heaven you'd have thought would be a pretty strong um, terms of ownership so it's not surprising that they were misled by that okay now going back to the printing um, when I looked at this table that William had done um, it came to about 2,000 books and I thought blimey just in one year and then I looked in the top left hand corner it says March and April and so he was just churning out a phenomenal amount of um, material and um, and he was not only printing he was he was book binding storing dispensing selling taking in money to sell these um, sell the New Testaments and so on off and um, the calculation is that between 35 and 1840 um, he had published about he printed about 3.5 million pages in 1840 2 million more pages and um, he became known as the Caxton of New Zealand and um, yeah he later on remarked here I mean this is quite important actually he, he's arguing here that the amount that he produced on the press was worth more than the whole body of missionaries put together so in a way you could say that's a bit of an embittered feeling but um but you know it's kind of like his point of view that they were all sort of running around talking and he was actually churning out thousands and thousands of um uh, books and, and new testaments and and so on and prayer books okay now what happened here was that he wrote back to the CMS in England and said could I please go back home and he was due to coming up for a seven year um, period when um, there was uh, in, in theory the entitlement to um, to have a year off sabbatical sort of thing like a sabbatical and um, the reasons he gave were he wanted to see his parents fair enough he wanted to have a break from the owner's labours before sunrise till midnight and sometimes um, he wanted to be ordained. There was no bishop in New Zealand, so he wanted to go back, be ordained, and then go forth among the heathen, going, venturing further away from the established mission station, and he wanted to get married. Okay, now he got a reply from them in 1841, which was no. And, um, well, it wasn't just no, they said they asked him to waive his rights to return after seven years, so... And it was because um, he lived, he, he worked in a sphere of labour um, which was so important to them, and um, it would be seriously inconvenienced and disadvantaged them if he, if he went. So um, he didn't. But he was cheered up by his interest in botany, and this is very endearing. He sort of this is where he comes across a flower, and um, he thinks he says, "Oh yes, this must be the one that Sir Joseph Banks saw in 1769." And um, these are sort of um, uh, this is a letter from a friend he gets, which says, you know. You must do your missionary work first, but but um, you know let botany be your kind of recreation. And, and further down, in regards to the botany of these islands, daily be coming more and more important in the eyes of Europe in the age of colonisation. And that's right because what happened in August 1841 was that Joseph Dalton arrived in the Erebus um, in August, and um, these are the scientists, some of the scientists that we saw before connected with them, um, Bishop Colenso. And the first, the two there, um, leaving aside Cook, Darwin and Dalton, they did drop in and see um, uh, William Colenso. In the case of Hooker, he sought him out because he had heard um, that he was um, done lots of botanical work. And that was the beginning of a lifelong friendship. And this is Hooker writing to his father, saying when he bade, he bade goodbye to his friend Colenso, we formed an intimacy which shall never be forgotten by me. <coughs> Pardon me. William Clinzo wrote to him saying, you know, how much he, he, he loved doing botany, but he would have to put it second to the welfare of the natives. Okay, when um, Hooker published a book um, on the flora of New Zealand, he dedicated it to William Clinzo. Okay, um, now... Yeah, three things happened in 1842, um, which if you remember the reasons why William Clenzo wanted to go back to England, these three things did change the situation. A bishop was sent out, a prince was sent out to relieve him, and he, he proposed marriage. Um, okay, so um, firstly the Bishop of um, New Zealand came out in um, 1842 um, 
Bishop Augustus Selwyn. He was also promoted by William Wilberforce, who um, we heard about before, and as was mentioned in the talk by Stephen Morn, and um, he arrived to sort of establish his authority over the CMS missionaries, which was a matter of sort of conflict really. And we we saw the differences between difference in approach between the CMS and the SPG before, and in fact there was quite a lot of tension there, which did actually come to come to uh, fruition uh, at this time. And the conflict that William had with the bishop should be seen in the context of that sort of um, conflict between those two approaches. So the bishop arrived in New Zealand and um, he had these very funny ideas. The first idea he had was that he thought because he was the bishop of New Zealand, he should be, he should be able to decide what should be printed on the printing press. And um, William Colenso was quick to disabuse him of that. He pointed out that the printing press was provided by the Church Missionary Society and therefore it was up to them what was printed on it and they delegated that to the missionaries. So it was them rather than the bishop that should decide. So that was the beginning of not a very good relationship, as you can imagine. Um, the bishop also thought that he should be um, have the authority to decide where the missionaries should go and William Colenso pointed out that that was not for him to decide either because it was the CMS that appointed them. And um, so that didn't go very well, really. Um, I mean, it was good that a printer was sent out to relieve William Colenso, but um, and then uh, there was the marriage, and um, he wrote to um, a woman who he hadn't seen since childhood, who had moved to another missionary station, proposed marriage, and um, went to see her. They um, decided to to sort of um, delay things for a year and he came back. Um, however, by then, Bishop Selwyn had talked about ordaining him, and um, so um, he objected um, to, the, to the delay in the marriage because he wanted, he wanted him to marry so his wife could actually run the missionary school. And so William was pushed into a hasty marriage. Um, he was then offered ordination, and then the bishop pulled out his trump card and said, well, you can only be ordained on condition that you agree to obey me. And they had this five hour long argument the night before William was about to, um, to be ordained. And it seems to me that a five hour argument suggests that the sort of the conflict is still very great. So, um, yeah. But anyway, um, he was ordained. And um, yeah, sorry, I'm sort of I'm, staying I'm, over a bit. I'm feeling that surprisingly the heretic bishop is, is oh yeah neglected. right okay well, let's let's get on to him okay <laughs> but, um, um, but we need to yeah. know the denouement for yeah. William <laughs> okay right so um yes he was ordained and um moved to another mission station uh, am I gonna have that? I haven't got that here um in the south of um the North Island um in a place called Hawkes Bay and he went there with his uh, newlywed wife um, and he established himself really as a sort of like a lone um, missionary amongst a very wide area, 10,000 square miles of, um, of territory with no other missionaries there, so he had a sort of massive um, area. Um, he, um, and um, he sort of became very involved with the Maori language and culture and um, he, um, actually he got so involved, he was so much in the Maori universe that at one point when um, they were talking about their children going to school in Auckland later on, they were worried because they couldn't speak English very well. They just spoke Maori um, in the in the house at home because there were Maori attached to the home. And um, he didn't get on very well with um, white settler society. Oh, hang on, I'll come to that in a minute. Yeah, um, what I was going to say here was that he's he he, he was really getting a heightened view of. Um, his idea of what a missionary should be like. And here he's talking about how there's a need for practical experience. And he says, a man may be able to compose the most excellent discourse. He may, he may, he may write an elegant and classical Latin essay. Yea, he may pass his Greek examination with ease and applause and yet be very unfit for a practical missionary and make after all but a very sorry figure in the field. And um, later he writes again in, in the same theme. And that's really kind of touched off by the fact that um, when the bishop had arrived, he had brought with him a number of educated missionaries, more like the gentleman missionaries we referred to before. And he set himself up at a, an inland missionary station with and established a college, which he called St. John's College. 
um, and that's where he'd been at Cambridge, where he was a near contemporary of Bishop Glenzer, actually, funny enough. Um, okay, but um, oh yeah, what I've done there is I've just sort of colour coded the different references to practicality as opposed to education. But he did, um, oh yeah, and in fact, this actually does um, relate to, for example, um, uh, a mission pre a sermon preached by Thomas Howes. Do you say Hawes or is that how? Hawes. Yeah, somehow okay. people pronounce right. strangely. Yeah. Yeah. And um, he says something very similar. He talks about the need to, be, to have a plain man full of faith in the Holy Ghost being infinitely preferable to all the learning of the schools. So here we've got a sort of conflict between the educational um, side of things. And in fact, he did go on further to say, not only do you not be ordained to be able to preach to the heathen, but actually being ordained is itself not a qualification itself for actually being being able to do so. So in a way it's really sort of downgrading the sort of formal hierarchy of the church. Okay, sorry, I've got here Hawke's Bay is, is down to the south. It's um, there. That's where he was. And he had all this territory around here. Okay, that's the printing press he took there. Um, he was just, for example, written off as a vulgar-minded, ignorant man by this um, judge who said um, uh, the missionary cleanser was a prince's boy then a catechist and is and always will be a vulgar and ignorant man it is by this class that the respectable and well-educated missionaries are brought into bad repute so he's you know the fact he was a printer is actually being sort of tagged to him uh, okay now however um, he did establish a relationship with Governor Eyre who was appointed Lieutenant Governor of um, of that area of New Zealand we saw earlier, um, who did invite him into his house and sort of asked him to bring his ragged natives with him, but he, he declined. And that's significant because, um, oh yes, that's, that's just uh, highlighting that one bit where he had this invite to sort of go and stay in his house. He rejected the invitation because he thought it would sort of look as if he was colluding too much with these secular powers. Um, he later wrote to Governor Eyre saying, look, I'm thinking of going to Australia. Um, and uh, the bottom paragraph there says, Mrs. Colenso said she would look after the children and also the station and schools during my two years absence, which is pretty good of her, really. But, um, um, but actually, there could be, a cynic might say that there could be a, a connection here between the timing of this letter being written and the fact that at this point in time, a Maori woman was in the later stages of pregnancy with a child that he had fathered. And so... There may well be some sort of duplicity here with his wife and also him wanting to get the hell out of it. Um, so that didn't happen and the child was born, he had to own up to it and he was um, suspended by um, the Bishop Selwyn and the sentence says we, we hereby inhibit you from ministering henceforth and so on. So, as, as was his cousin inhibited from um, preaching but for different reasons. Okay, so, um, so now... Yeah, really have overshot on um, There is this kind of scene which is quite important where he's been sacked in effect and um, he's been told to get out of the house uh, where he was living and um, one day the bishop and the governor turn up together and um, with a couple of entrepreneurs it's a kind of interesting sort of combination of secular spiritual authority and also um, the um, capitalists um, and he says at the bottom, I never wish to see the bishop again unless it may be, unless it please, may please God to convert him. That's him saying, I don't consider the bishop is actually a converted man. He doesn't have the grace of God in him. As um, uh, Thomas Hills was saying, you know, it's, it's, it's along those lines really. So he considers himself to be, he considers the bishop to be sort of unregenerate. Um, okay, so um, the bishop put to him four proposals to get out of the district, to get out of the house, give up his child, and consent to abide by this, the central committee. To none of them, however, I would consent. And that's just his sort of obstinacy. And he's just saying, look, I think I'm right, so I don't care who you bring up, just because you brought the governor along, doesn't mean I'm gonna kind of cave in. And, um, okay. Now that sort of really kind of highlights the close cooperation between the governor and the bishop. And um, they then went sailed off into the sunset, literally, because they went back to England and um, I wanted to do a bit here I'm just going to try and wrap up as quick as I can um, about the connection between the bishops and the governors actually maybe I should skip 
right to the end. I know it's Possibly. difficult for you yeah. with your PowerPoint, but yeah. uh, as I say, I, my yeah. concern is that okay. uh, the comparison is of tremendous interest to people yeah. in the room. And Well, um, I'll skip through here to um, show that um, there is a connection right, here between right. the two colonies, between the, the, the different bishops, and um, Bishop Selwyn went back to England with uh, Governor Gray uh, together, and uh, that was because Governor Gray was on his way to South Africa, his mm. next posting, mm. where he was to go and have quite close cooperation with Bishop Colenso. But also Selwyn wanted to go back to meet Bishop Wilberforce to get support for his <laughs> um, intention to expand into Melanesia, to expand his diocese. And that was the kind of thing that Wilberforce was very keen on supporting, as he also supported Bishop Gray expanding in the East and Central Africa. Um, but I've also got here that um, William Clenzo and Bishop Clenzo were also also appealed to their respective governors for support in going further themselves. Okay, now I'm just thinking. Uh, okay, what I could do is um, just try and skip on pretty near to the end. Um, oh, that's um, yeah, that's Bishop Stowe uh, where Bishop Clenzo is set up. Um, I would suggest Gothic. Um, revival Gothic architecture there, which was going on in England at the same time, but um, that's Ekukanyeni, the mission station. On the right is William Ngidi, who was the person who objected to the story of Noah's Ark in the Old Testament. And um, oh yeah, this is what I want to say about um, industrial institutions. Um, we had a talk um, last time by Aaron Kumar about industrial industrial institutions in Tamil Nadu, South uh, India. And um, here Bishop Clenzo is objecting to the governor of Natal, that is, not the governor of Cape Town, which George Gray was, um, wanting to produce um, Africans as machines for the purpose of European masters. But what he wanted was to produce better and nobler men. And he had a totally different idea of the purposes of education. But I can't elaborate on that now, really. Okay. Um, that was another of um, uh, Bishop's Princes, K, okay, um, who had some things to say about Bishop Clinton about how he was really a, he was really black. Which there's a word Muntu, which also means human. Um, this is some of his publications. The translation um, into Zulu. I wanted to refer to Joe's uh, paper here, where he is said by his biographer here to be translating in the idiom that the Zulu use themselves. And um, Joe gave a very interesting paper where. Tio Soga was in dispute with um, Wesleyan missionaries over bringing neologisms into the text and not using their idiom. And um, it's suggested here that he was using that idiom. Okay, um, this is Bishop Selwyn, just flashing back to New Zealand, who's by now appointed five bishops, sorry, four bishops as well as himself. And um, they joke here about um, three Eton bishops consecrating a fourth Eton man. So it's getting like the government front bench. Really. <laughs> but, um, but it is a long way away from the kind of ideal that Sir William Colenso had and Thomas Hales had about sort of plain, simple men um, bringing forth the, go the gospel. And this, um, just the capital, this is a picture of the latest bishop he's um, uh, appointed uh, uh, as captain of the first 11 at Eton. And the caption says, yeah, captain of the first Eton 11. Okay. Um, now, Bishop Colenso was um, basically uh, starting to produce uh, material which was heretical, according to um, the orthodox doctrine of, of the um, church, and including denial, denying the doctrine of eternal punishment, um, asserting that men are saved merely by being members of the human family, um, denying the sacraments necessary for salvation. That's a very heretical thing, which goes very much against the high church SPG view of things. Um, Okay, rejecting this substitution theory of atonement. Okay, this is uh, William Ngidi saying, surely you can't believe it was this Noah's Ark story, it's just crazy. And, um, <laughs> okay, and this is a, this, uh, these are the, um, um, showing the scientists backing both the Darwinian evolution theory, Bishop Glenzo, and also the controversy between Governor Eyre and the Jamaica Committee after the Morant Bay <laughs> uprising. And we've got all the scientists lined up on one side, but the literary people um, seem to have moved across bottom basically because of holding a very derogatory view of Africans. Okay, um, the trial of the bishop, um, charges against him, the judgment, 
uh, was that their lordships decided that the trial that he'd been subjected to in Cape Town was null and void. So um, if Bishop Gray ever had any kind of nightmares, he might well have that coming up in them. Okay, right, I'm just going to try and do a two-minute finish off now. Okay, there are some different views of Bishop Plenzo's biblical criticism and very extreme differences. This one is by a sort of reputed leading member of this, the church establishment, really, saying that he had no sense of history, no idea how to criticise documents, no wide reading, no profundity of mind. Um, whereas we get a totally contrary view from John Rogerson, who is a leading um, scholar of biblical criticism in the, in the 19th century. Um, but anyway, that's what you've had a handout of. Okay, this is Bishop Plenzo's two endeavours. Okay, one more minute. This is Bishop Plenzo's two great endeavours, a very simple way that some historians have, have tried to sort of categorise what he did. On the one hand, seeking truth, and on the, on the second hand, seeking justice, because he then took up the defence of the Zulu people, which we can't really go into. I want to go straight to um, looking at a term which one critic, um, one reviewer of books published in the, centi the bicentenary of um, David Livingstone, um, got fed up with the word iconic being used and sort of said it should be banned. That was Terry. Um, okay, now I'm sorry Terry, but I'm going to use the word, but I'm going to suggest why Bishop Plenzo and William Plenzo weren't iconic in this country anyway. And um, what I want to look at is how to be iconic in Britain. <laughs> okay, firstly diversify and do lots of things like Livingstone did. But the last of those bullet points, campaigning for a humanitarian cause, um, has to be outside the frontiers of the British Empire, I suggest. This is just my kind of idea, so you know, I'd be interested if people didn't agree. Because the oppressor is then not British and not a British colonial authority. It could be Portuguese or it could be the Arabs, and they're trying to promulgate a rival world religion anyway. So, um, okay, self-sacrifice by isolation from the comforts of home, hazards to health, life and limb. Publicity, return to the UK, write a book, address meetings, ten conferences and so on. But you've got to go back there, I think. Um, okay, timing before the late 1870s. After that, it was military men and rather than men of peace who became national heroes because we had the, Ang the Anglo Zulu War, 79, the song Jing about jingoism coming up in 78. Okay, now, but however, contrary to all of those things, so I mean, I think Bishop Kenzo didn't fit in with those points, but contrary to that, there's this charming book by France Gregg. Uh, published in 1898, where she's trying to elevate him to iconic status. Okay, just another one minute. Okay, and she, she tries to attribute to him sort of saintly, self-sacrificial um, features and also <laughs> be um, uh, following in the power of England. Okay, so now, okay, was William <coughs> Colenso, why wasn't William Colenso a iconic? Well, the answer is he was, but only in New Zealand where he's attributed with doing all these things. Okay, and there are plaques around New Zealand for him. This one for the printing, the first printing in the Maori language of the New Testament. This is a school opened in, eight, eight, in 1959, can't read that very well. These are his travels, and he was considered the pioneer explorer. And this is a, a plaque dedicating a route um, across this mountain range to him. And this is the flower named after him. We've already seen that he had the books dedicated by um, uh, David Hooker, who nominated him to be a fellow of the Royal Society, which was an incredible feat for somebody living in the outback um, that long ago. And, and he, he was started as a printer. That's right, a lowly printer, printer's boy, not yeah. not a printer. Yeah. Okay. And um, okay, that's a bit about that. Oh yeah, and I've done that. Now, in fact, it's quite appropriate that we should have an avenue named after him, along with Hooker. And so they put in Kipling for good measure. Okay. Now there was this bicentenary conference. Um, that portrait was commissioned especially for the conference. The men in suits here are, on the left, Peter Wells, the author of a, um, a late, the latest biography of him, and with his back to the painting is a govern government minister who came to open the conference, and um, his name is Chris Finneson, Minister of those two different departments, Arts, Culture and Heritage, and for the Treaty of Waitangi negotiations. He said he wasn't quite sure which of those capacities he was there in, but I think both. And um, now the interesting thing about this conference is, just another 30 seconds, is that, um, <laughs> okay, big conference, people all over the world were there, um, historians, relatives and so on, and we didn't know this, but the next day 
um, a descendant of William Clinton who was there invited me to go out to a school where her daughter-in-law's sister taught out in the outskirts of Napier where it's Maori territory and they have these carvings, traditional carvings called Po, which are sort of carved figures representing a characters from their ancestors or mythological background of importance. And there is one there, which is reportedly of William Colenso. Mm -hmm. And now that doesn't look much like his earlier picture of him, but there are symbolic things here as well. So there's a book there and there's staves and so on, they all represent things. But if you look at a portrait of him in his old age, um, perhaps it's not so far off. <laughs> okay. And now, uh, when I went up to Waitangi, I, I spoke to the um, uh, to the uh, Maori sort of guide there, and she said she had never heard of a Pākehā, that's a white man, um, being represented in one of these forms. You should be very honoured. So I am. Okay. Now, I can't resist showing you the kids in the school around it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, just there's just one last thing. I wanted to say this is breaking news which is that um uh, yeah okay breaking news um bishop colenso is related to a person who is currently prominently prominent in the church of england namely justin welby the archbishop of canterbury <laughs> and um this is discovered by alan <laughs> collins <laughs> yeah sorry about this but um but um, jo um bishop colenso's sister is the grand was the great grandmother of rab butler whose sister Iris Butler is the grandmother of Justin Porton, Porton <laughs> yeah. and um, so uh, who's recently didn't have time to actually um, do a scan of this but he's recently been sort of increasingly outspoken and um, <laughs> he's going on about tax dodgers here and so I have to say add the caveat that um, Bishop Colenso can't be held responsible for any uh, of the um, comments made by um, Justin Welby but he might well agree with them <laughs> okay, so that's it really. Thank so, you very much. Thank you. Thank you.